As fall breaks out in Canada, I'm reminded of all the beauty, innocence, and gun-free fun available from our neighbors to the north. There's the majesty of Toronto, vast hockey rinks, spectacular batches of poutine, and gallons of maple syrup that you can chug openly and guilt-free, for this maple syrup is pure and nourishing. The changing of the seasons also happens to be the perfect time to encounter one of Canada's most prized creatures, the artificial intelligence nerd. Not too long ago, these beings were rare and hidden away in university dungeons. But today, they flourish. They primp with instinctual grace. They wave their hands impressively to assert their intellectual dominance. They carb load like overpaid professional athletes. And this makes some sense because they're among the best paid professionals in the world. Together, these creatures did something truly remarkable. Without anyone paying much notice, they gave birth to an AI revolution. They turned Canada, yes, Canada, into one of the great AI superpowers. This is the story of how all this came to be. It's the story of one nation's quest to teach computers to think like humans. It's the story of what this science experiment will mean for all our lives <laughs> and for the future of the human species. So if you're a human or something trying to imitate one, you'll want to pay attention. Ever since people first came up with the idea of computers, they've dreamed of imbuing them with artificial intelligence. I am a smart fellow, as I have a very fine brain. That's the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. AI is just a computer that is able to mimic or simulate uh, human thought or human behavior. Uh, within that, there's a subset called machine learning that is now the underpinning of what is most exciting about AI. By allowing computers to learn how to solve problems on their own, machine learning has made a series of breakthroughs that once seemed nearly impossible. It's the reason computers can understand your voice, spot a friend's face in a photo, and steer a car. And it's the reason people are actively talking about the arrival of human-like AI, and whether that would be a good thing or a horrific end of days thing. Many people made this moment possible, but one figure towers above the rest. I've come to the University of Toronto to see the man they call the godfather of modern artificial intelligence, Jeff Hinton. Because of a back condition, Jeff Hinton hasn't been able to sit down for more than 12 years. I hate standing. I'd much rather sit down, but if I sit down, I have a disc that comes out. So okay. Well, at least now standing desks are fashionable. And yeah, but I was ahead. <laughs> I, was standing when, I was standing when they weren't fashionable. <laughs> Since he can't sit in a car or on a bus, Hinton walks everywhere. The walk says a lot about Hinton and his resolve. For nearly 40 years, Hinton has been trying to get computers to learn like people do. A quest almost everyone thought was crazy, or at least hopeless, right up until the moment it revolutionized the field. 
Google thinks this is the future of the company. Amazon thinks it's the future of the company. Apple thinks it's the future of the company. My own department thinks this stuff's probably nonsense and we shouldn't be doing any more of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I talked everybody into it except my own department. <laughs> you obviously grew up in the, the UK, and you had this very prestigious family full of, of famous mathematicians and economists. And I was, you know, I was curious what it was like for you. Yeah, there was a lot of pressure. Um, I think by the time I was about seven, I realized I was going to have to get a PhD. Um, <laughs> Did you rebel against that, or you, you went along I with it? I dropped out every so often. Yeah. I became a carpenter for a while. Jeff Hinton, pretty early on, became obsessed with this idea of figuring out how the mind works. He started off getting into physiology, the anatomy of how the brain worked. Then he got into psychology. And then finally, he settled on more of a computer science approach to modeling the brain and got into artificial intelligence. My feeling is, if you want to understand a really complicated device, like a brain, you should build one. I mean, you could look at cars and you could think you could understand cars. When you try and build a car, you suddenly discover that there's this stuff that has to go under the hood, otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> As Jeff was starting to think about these ideas, he got inspired by some AI researchers across the pond. Specifically this guy, Frank Rosenblatt. Rosenblatt, um, in the late 1950s, developed what he called a perceptron, and it was a neural network, a computing system that would mimic the brain. The basic idea is a collection of small units called neurons. These are little computing units, but they're actually modeled on the way that the human brain does its computation. They take incoming data like we do from our senses, and they actually learn, so the neural net can learn to make decisions over time. Rosenblatt's hope was that you could feed a neural network a bunch of data, like pictures of men and women, and it would eventually learn how to tell them apart, just like humans do. There was just one problem. It didn't work very well. Rosenblatt, his neural network was a single layer of neurons, and it was limited in what it could do, extremely limited. And a colleague of his wrote a book in the late 60s that showed these limitations and it kind of put the whole area of research into a deep freeze for a good 10 years. No one wanted to work in this area. They were sure it would never work. Well, almost no one. It was just obvious to me that it was the right way to go. The brain's a big neural network, and so it has to be that stuff like this can work because it works in our brains. There's just never any doubt about that. Now, what do you think it was inside of you that kept you wanting to pursue this when everyone else was giving up, just that you thought it was the right direction to go? No, that everyone else was wrong. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Hinton decides he's got an idea of how these neural nets might work, and he's going to pursue it no matter what. For a little while, he's bouncing around research institutions in the US. He kind of gets fed up that most of them are funded by the Defense Department, and he starts looking for somewhere else he can go. I didn't want to take Defense Department money. I sort of didn't like the idea that this stuff was going to be used for purposes that I didn't think were good. He suddenly hears that Canada might be interested in funding artificial intelligence. And that was very attractive, that I could go off to this civilized town and just get on with it. So I came to the University of Toronto. And then in the mid-80s, we discovered how to make more complicated neural nets so they could solve those problems that the simple ones couldn't solve. He and his collaborators developed a multi-layered neural network, a deep neural network. And this started to work in a lot of ways. Using a neural network, a guy named Dean Pomerleau built a self-driving car in the late 80s, and it drove on public roads. Jan LeCun in the 90s built a system that could recognize handwritten digits, and this ended up being used commercially. But again, they hit a ceiling. They didn't work quite well enough because we didn't have enough data and we didn't have enough compute power. 
And people in AI and computer science have decided neural networks was wishful thinking, basically. So it was a big disappointment. Through the 90s, into the 2000s, Jeff was one of only a handful of people on the planet who were still pursuing this technology. He would show up at academic conferences and be banished to the back rooms. He was treated as really like a pariah. Was there like a time when you thought this just wasn't going to work and, and you, you no. did have some self-doubt? I mean, I, there were many times when I thought, I'm not going to make this work. <laughs> But Jeff was consumed by this and couldn't stop. He just kept pursuing the idea that computers could learn until about 2006, when the world catches up to Hinton's ideas. Computers were now a lot faster. And now it's behaving like I thought it would behave in the mid 80s. It's solving everything. The arrival of super fast chips and the massive amounts of data produced on the internet gave Hinton's algorithms a magical boost. Suddenly, computers could identify what was in an image. Then, they could recognize speech and translate from one language to another. By 2012, words like neural nets and machine learning were popping up on the front page of the New York Times. You have to go all these years, and then all of a sudden, you know, in the span of a few months, it yeah. just takes off. Did it finally feel like, aha, you know, the world has finally come to my vision? It was sort of a relief that people finally came to their senses. <laughs> Next up, we have Professor Jeffrey Hinton uh, of the University of Toronto. Thank you. For Hinton, this is obviously a really redemptive moment. Now he's basically a technology celebrity. And for Canada, it's the country's moment as well. They have more AI researchers than just about any other place on the planet. And the quest now is to see what these guys can do, starting companies and pushing the technology forward. I'm going to set out on a journey across Canada to see the best in Canadian AI technology and to get a feel for how far the technology has come and how far it still has to go. Here is a city that gets right at the central tension of modern life and the unfolding AI revolution. It's Montreal a place filled with beauty and old world charms that asks you to move slowly through its streets and to chill for a while, reflect, and think deep thoughts. At the same time, it's one of the world's top AI research centers. Students flock here from all over the globe to get deep with machine learning and to take Jeff Hinton's ideas and figure out how to turn them into products we all use. To see just how successful they've been, look no further than your pocket. All this stuff started out as hardcore computer science, but over the last five years, AI has invaded our everyday lives. Your smartphone is packed full of AI-powered apps, including something like Google Translate that lets you point your phone at a magazine that's written in French and read it as if you were a local. Engineers have been trying to get computers to translate text like this for decades, but it was Jeff's neural nets that finally made it possible. Thanks, Jeff. And it's not just your smartphone. Neural networks are heading for the open road. Off we go. Meet my friend Stefan, the head of Montreal's Tesla fan club. I'm driving a Tesla for a little bit more than four years and a half. Do you have people asking you for rides all the time? Yes, all the time. <laughs> Maybe that's because of his fancy pants autopilot, Tesla's semi-autonomous driving system that kicks in when road conditions are right. 
So that's it, autopilot's on. Yes, and it's driving by itself. So we need to pay attention. That's, we don't have to drive. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Self-driving cars are packed full of cameras, sensors, and radar. When teamed with computer vision neural nets, it's this technology that lets the cars build a picture of the world. The technology has a long way to go, but this Tesla can monitor all the cars around it, switch lanes, and park, all by itself. Thanks, Jeff. So you're living in the future. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you try it once, it's very difficult to do without it because I just can be relaxed and we can drive like this. Oops, there's a stop sign. So that's why we still need to pay attention. <laughs> Back on the sidewalk, I tap those neural nets again. This time in the form of speech recognition. Find me some poutine, eh? I found a few places within 8.4 kilometers. Speech recognition used to suck, but now it's pretty darn good. Why? A neural net, of course. Thanks, Jeff. The Google brain sent me here for an artery hardening affair with poutine. Once a simple Quebec dish of cheese curds, french fries, and gravy, it's been disrupted. The Dan Dan. Pepperoni, bacon, and onions. Here we go. It's gooey, glorious, and blessedly algorithm-free. We'll know the humans are toast when they can make stuff like this. Part of Hinton's legacy lies beyond these examples of AI in the world. He's also inspired a legion of disciples spreading the good word of neural nets. Joshua Bengio is a professor at the University of Montreal. He's one of the researchers who glommed on to Hinton's ideas when it seemed to make little sense to do so. Over the years, he's formed a mind meld with Hinton. And together, they've come up with many of the key concepts behind modern AI. You guys worked on this stuff through the 80s, 90s, the 2000s. And then it just seemed like this totally went from computer science and research to we see it everywhere in our lives. Are you, you know, are even you surprised what's happened the last five years that it, that it really is yeah. like sitting on all our phones? And the, the rate at which the progress and the industrial products have been coming out is totally something we didn't expect. Even now, it's hard to predict. Where are we going? Is it going to slow down? Or are we going to continue with this exponential increase? It's thanks to Yashua that Montreal is full of top-notch AI graduate talent. This, in turn, has brought tech giants like Google and Facebook to town, along with their ample checkbooks. To me, it seems like if you're good at AI, you can make two, three hundred thousand dollars a year. It's crazy to see how much these guys get paid now. A million dollars is something quite common as a salary. Have you ever had a country offer you an incredible amount of money to come set up a lab there? Not a country, but yeah, companies, yeah. But Yashua has rejected the lucrative offers of Big Neural Net. He remains committed to the ivory towers of academia, which is a better fit for his philosophical approach to AI. You've got guys like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking that sometimes paint this technology in a very, very dark light that it could run amok and start doing things on its own. What, you know, what do you feel when you hear people say things like that? I'm not concerned about technology running amok. Of, uh, the Terminator scenario, I think, is not very credible. And uh, I also believe that if we're able to build machines that are as, as smart as us, they're also smart enough 
to understand our values and to understand our moral system and, and, and so act in a way that's good for us. Now, I think there are real concerns, which is essentially misuse of AI to influence people's minds. It's already happening with political advertising. Yeah, I mean, we've already seen like the stuff from Facebook. So I think we should be careful about this and try to regulate the use of AI in, in places where it's morally wrong, ethically wrong. I think we just should just ban it and make it you know, illegal. It's comforting that Yashua has these concerns. But hop down the road from the university, and reality, or what's left of it, becomes messier. This tiny room is the home to a startup called Liarbird. It was founded by Yashua's former students and has built an app that can clone your voice. Are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices? This is huge. It can make us say anything now, really anything. One of its founders is this guy, Mexican expat Jose. He taught me the art of the clone. So you will need to record yourself for a few minutes of audio. Thousands of letters danced across the amateur author's screen. When you start to eat like this, something is the matter. You guys better quit politics and take in washing. I don't know where that one came from. <laughs> okay, so create my digital voice now. Creating your digital voice takes at least one minute. One minute, my God. Yeah, so before, to create some uh, artificial voice of someone, you would need to record yourself for um, at least uh, eight hours. Test your voice. All right, so now I get to type something. Yeah, so the moment of the truth. Okay. Once Liarbird's AI has worked its magic, after I'm done typing. Oh, I gotta spell better. Any words I put into the app can be played back in my digital voice. And here's the crazy thing even words I never actually said in the first place. Artificial intelligence technology seems to be advancing very quickly. Should we be afraid? I mean, I can definitely hear my voice in there. That's, that is, that's really interesting. I just picked those words at random and I definitely did not say some of them. And it's like flawless and being able to sort of pick from just about any word and, and manufacture it. Hello world is the best show I have ever seen. <laughs> This technology seems sweet, but lends itself to all manner of trickery. I've popped back to my hotel to test out the Liarbird technology a little bit, and you can see some really obvious ways that this could be abused. This is, this is fake Donald Trump talking. The United States is considering in addition to other options, stopping all trade with any country doing business with North Korea. And then you could picture somebody taking over your voice and creating some mayhem in your personal life. Now, to really put my computer voice to the test, I am going to call my dear sweet mother and see if she recognizes me. Hey, Mom. Hi. What are you guys up to today? Um, well, it's shut down. We didn't have any electricity early this morning, and we're just hanging around the house. I'm just finishing up work and waiting for the boys to get home. OK. I think I'm coming down with a virus. Oh, why well, you feel bad, hey? <laughs> I was messing around with you. You were talking to a computer. I felt like I was talking to you. It's amazing. <laughs> Is that scary or, or good? It could be scary if it was something really important. It's you now, isn't it, Ash? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like you. Is it? Yes, it sounds <laughs> like it, yeah. After realizing that anyone with the time and inclination could mess with my life, there was only one thing left to do. I joined Jose and a few other liarbirds to chat more about the evils of AI while dulling my fear with booze. Obviously, some people are freaked out by this technology because we're already, like, blurring the line about truth and reality. 
Of course, there is some risk in in uh, in people using this kind of technology for bad applications. Unfortunately, technology is it's not possible to stop it. So the ethical path that we have decided is to show this to people, to make them know that this kind of technology is available, and so to make them more cautious on this kind of uh, subject. We really believe that right now, when the technology is not perfect, is the right time to let people kind of play with it, get used to it slowly. So you guys think that the idea is just sort of new and that's why it scares people, but if you get used to it, it's just that's just the way it is. We want our technology to be used for, for positive things. It's not something that we should be really afraid of. It's something that we should be careful about, but I feel enthusiastic about. It's nice to be enthusiastic. It's also nice to meditate on the consequences of your inventions instead of turning our souls over to chance and blind luck. But it is kind of cool to be a cynical bastard in my new artisanal computer voice. Welcome, Russian friends, to our huge, wonderful, and very pure elections. The real artificial intelligence weirdos in Canada live here, in Edmonton. This is a large, but very, very cold and very, very flat city that is more or less in the middle of nowhere. It's the kind of place that has a giant butter vault to help people survive the lean winter months. Canadians like to put the best possible spin on how these conditions bring out interesting traits in people. Ask anyone, like this guy from the Edmonton Tourist Center. Well, Edmonton's uh, one of those cities that isn't, you know, automatically listed in the top cities in Canada in terms of size or scale or, or, or notice even, but it's always had a really neat quality to it of that Western independent spirit that you see very much in, in Alberta in general, combined with a conscience and a, a thoughtfulness. Over at the University of Alberta, some of the most far out AI research in the world is taking place. The man I'm here to see is the university's very own AI godfather, Rich Sutton. Rich is considered one of the great revolutionary thinkers in AI. You are not Canadian. <laughs> I am Canadian. You are, <laughs> but not by birth. Uh, no, I was born in the U.S., but uh, now I'm just Canadian. Okay. And what brought you to Canada? The politics. I wanted to get away from difficult times in the United States. The United States was invading other countries in 2003 when I came here, and I didn't care for all that. Sutton entered the field of AI in the mid-'80s. And like Jeff Hinton and Joshua Bengio, he was a big believer in neural networks. But Sutton has a different idea about how to further the technology. Unlike Hinton's method of feeding neural networks reams and reams of data and telling them what to do, Sutton wants them to learn more naturally from experience, an approach called reinforcement learning. Well, reinforcement learning, it's like what animals do and what people do. You try several things, the things that work best, you keep doing those, and things that don't work out so well, you stop doing them. And how do you teach a computer um, well, you, that, all you that, need, that idea? <laughs> all you need is a sense, the computer has to have a sense of what's good and what's bad. And so you give it a special signal called the reward. If the reward is high, that means it's good. If the reward is low, that means it's bad. To see reinforcement learning in action, I found Marlos, an industrious young Brazilian who's created an AI to play his video games for him. His algorithm plays the game thousands of times and gradually learns from experience how to do better. So the goal of this game is that you are this yellow blob, and what you have to do is that you have to get as many potions as you can while avoiding harpies. And this is like the AI going at this for the first time. It's the AI run it for the first time. So it just bumps into things. If it gets points, it's happy. If it dies, it's unhappy. Yes. 
And the AI starts to figure out that maybe what I want to do is to collect these potions and avoid the harpies. And now we can look at AI that has ran for 5,000 games. Okay. And this is what it looks like. You can tell that it's smarter about its strategy. Yes. Then, then what happens if you run it 500,000 times? Oh, we, we get to the superhuman performance level. Though notching a high score is the noblest of pursuits, reinforcement learning has turned out to have all kinds of other applications. It's behind the algorithm that recommends movies and TV shows on Netflix and Amazon. It beat the world champion Go player, a feat previously thought impossible for a computer. Soon, it could read your brain waves and determine whether you have a mental disorder. But for Sutton, all that is just the beginning. We are trying to make real intelligence. We're trying to recreate human intelligence. Humans are our example. He sees reinforcement learning as the path to what futurists call the singularity, the moment when our AI creations light up and surge past human-level intelligence. Do you have a date for the singularity, or? So we give you, uh, it's, a, it's a quite broad probability distribution, and the median is at 2040. 2040. So that means equal chance of being before or after 2040. OK. The rationale goes like this. Uh, by 2030, we'll have the hardware. So give guys like me uh, another 10 years to figure out the algorithms, yeah. the software to go with the hardware to do it. It's going to be exciting where we're yeah. going. If 2040 seems like a long time to wait to meet a smart robot, do not fret. Over in the experimental wing of the university, there are co-eds hard at work blurring the line between humans and machines. Are you human? Of course not, but that shouldn't keep us from chatting. Case in point, homegrown Edmontonian genius Corey Mathewson. Tell me about this guy a little bit. Or yeah, sure. Yeah. sure. <laughs> so this is Blueberry. Uh, on Blueberry, I've deployed the improv system. So there's an artificial improv system running on Blueberry right now. Yes, that's right. Corey does improv comedy with a robot. I've been doing improv longer than I've been doing computing science. I've been doing it for 12 years, and I thought, you know, there's no more natural convergence than taking some of these state-of-the-art systems and putting them up on stage. One day we'll make it to the moon if this planet is not to be our last. It is the sky and the moon of the universe, the sun, the, the sun. sun. The sun. <laughs> the sky, the moon, and the universe, the, the sun. sun, the sun. <laughs> I keep thinking it's like a ventriloquist sort of. This is like a new age. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good way to put really it. Yeah. Strange yeah. twist on it. The piece that's different is that I don't know what it, it will say. Anything that comes from the system, it's generating live in the moment. Blueberry, I, I created you. I downloaded a voice into your brain so that you could perform in front of these people. But I do not know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to say either. To give Blueberry the power of surreal Canadian improv, Corey made use of some tech that should be familiar by now, a neural network. Step one, he feeds the network the dialogue from a bunch of movies, 102,000 movies to be exact. All the movies, every movie for 100 years. And that's just so it can learn language, see how somebody responds to somebody else. That's exactly right, yeah. It builds kind of a language model. Step two, he uses reinforcement learning to train the network, rewarding it when it makes sense and punishing it when it spits out gibberish. Time to put this wannabe kid in the hall to the test. There we go. Start improvising. OK. Campers, we're going to get ready for a real baseball game. Grab your gloves and grab your baseball bats, and let's get out there. Especially you, Franklin. Of course, I will not be much longer. OK, OK. Well, why aren't you ready for the match? I do not have any more good news if I were your boyfriend. <laughs> OK, come on, Franklin. You know how I feel about you, but you got to keep your head in the game right now. 
You will see if you do not stop here when you go, what have you done? <laughs> It's threatening you. I know. I will teach you what the character of your team is going to do. To you. Oh, Jesus. Put down the bat, Franklin. What are you doing? You have nothing to hide, that's all. <laughs> I, I've got nothing to hide. Look, this is all I am. <laughs> OK, uh, <laughs> end it there. That's great, that's man. That's sort of how so... it works. Obviously, some of the responses are a little bit weird, but then it's really funny, because then, as you're going along, it did hit a couple of things perfectly, and, and then it's like, yeah, I mean, it's extra hilarious because oh, now, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now it's going. Blueberry may not be ready for its Second City audition just yet, but Corey has a higher purpose, making AI relatable. Oh, it's going to move. It's going to move. It's going to move. No. <laughs> there is a fear in society of AI. So we are kind of humanizing this AI. We're, we're taking it down a peg. We're saying, don't be afraid of this tech. Look at how cute it is. Look at how kind of naive it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Filters. You've done it again, <laughs> Blueberry. Yes. Isn't there a flip side to that, though? Then you make it cute, and, and then people start to accept it, and you know, then, then we wake up. And... <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think that will happen in my time. The singularity may be near or it may be not so near. But if the inhabitants of this oddly beautiful place keep pushing the technology, they just might create something alarmingly human-like one day. For Rich Sutton, it's not a question of whether we'll get there, but whether we'll be able to accept our mechanized brethren. Our society will be, will be challenged. You know, it's just like every time, you know, our black people, people, are women people. We will do the same thing with robots eventually. Uh, are they allowed to own property? Are they allowed to earn an income? Or do they have to be owned by somebody? But a robot's obviously not a person. <laughs> right? No. <laughs> Last stop, I return to Toronto, home to 2.8 million people, one very tall tower, and of course, the godfather himself. Inside the system, there's lots of little processes which are a little bit like brain cells. They work a he may be an import, but Jeff Hinton has done something truly exceptional for Toronto. He's turned this city into an AI mecca, where AI conferences like this one seem to take place daily. And where young minds come to show off their ideas. Canada, if we're being honest, doesn't usually seem that intimidating. But thanks to Jeff, it's got nothing less than world domination in mind. We are enormously thankful to Canadians for inventing all this stuff because we now use it throughout our entire business. Should never we say have this. it on record that he owes, yeah. that Google owes Canada. We, we uh, absolutely owe Canada. <laughs> that was a mistake. The and, tech industry you know, is full of people who adore AI. And then also some famous types like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, who said, well, that AI might be the end of us. <laughs> to consider such dystopia in the proper light. I've come to Toronto's geekiest bar. Hello, George. To encase myself in this steel <laughs> container with George Dvorsky. He's a writer for Gizmodo and an AI philosopher. Well, since we're in the apocalyptic bar, what is the the con case around AI, what, what's, what's the nastiest scenario that everybody's worried about? Unfortunately, there's, there's no shortage of nasty scenarios. And this, I think this is what makes artificial intelligence such a scary thing, is all the different ways that it can go wrong. It can be everything from an accident, you know, where we just didn't think it through. We gave a, a, a very powerful computer instructions to do something. We thought we explained it articulately. We thought we gave it a concrete goal. And it completely took a different path than we thought it would in such a way that it actually caused some great damage. 
And I'm sure you've heard the old paperclip example, yeah. where uh, you're a paperclip manufacturer and you say, hey, we need lots of paperclips. And because the artificial intelligence has so much reach and so much power, it actually starts to go about converting all of the matter and all the molecules on the planet into paperclips. Before you know it, we've now converted the entire cosmos into paperclips. It's a crazy scenario, but it's an illustrative scenario. We can't be dismissive of the perils. I think that's ex exceptionally dangerous. And I don't think it's too early to start raising the alarm bells about it. Being turned into Clippy sounds awful. But fear not, we'll have years to ease into that sort of suffering as AI steadily plucks off one job after another. The first to go, of course, will likely be the always screwed factory workers. Which brings us to Suzanne Gildert, a budding AI overlord and founder of robotics startup Kindred AI. Tell me about these guys. So these are research prototypes. So they're some of the first robots we built at Kindred. We tend to work with small robots. It's a bit like uh, if you imagine a, a child growing up and it breaks a lot of things. Now imagine if the child was six feet tall when it had the brain of a six month old. It would be a terrible, <laughs> terribly dangerous. How many of these robots have ever slapped you? Uh, I have been hit in the face by robots a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne seems nice enough. She makes exotic digital art. And she loves cats to the point where she's built a robotic fleet of them for the office. This one I believe is called Pinkfoot. It's a quadruped robot loosely based on a cat anatomy, although it's uh, not a very highly faithful representation yet. And then when you were growing up, you would build things as well? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So I was really uh, enthralled by electronics at an early age. I guess most little girls would be looking at trays of, of beads and things, and I was looking at trays of like resistors and capacitors and little components, but having the same kind of reaction to them. But don't be fooled by the hobby electronics and the cute cat bots. Suzanne is a keen businesswoman. And Kindred has recently embarked on its first commercial venture. What's going on here is that we have a bank of robots that are learning. So they are continuously running, uh, picking up objects. And these would run all day? All day, all night. Powered by a neural network, these arms can do something that's very easy for a human, but very hard for a bot. Pick up objects of different shapes and put them down. Most factories still use people to do that sort of thing. Lots and lots of people. Today, everyone's shopping on e-commerce. Thousands and thousands of different types of objects, shapes, textures, weights. How do you pick that up? Right now it's humans. You have millions of humans in warehouses just like picking up things and putting it into another location. So we're teaching our robots how to do that. What's the hard part? It's figuring out what's a belt, what's a shirt, or it's just how to grasp it. Yeah, exactly. It's figuring out how to pick it up, right? So, so things will show up in any shape, right? And you gotta figure out how to pick it up without dropping it, uh, put it in the location. So it takes a lot of training. Part of that training involves, of all things, humans, robot pilots who manually control the arms while the AI watches and learns the finer points of grabbing. All right, ma'am, teach me how to use All this right, thing. have a seat. So you see a 3D mouse here. This lets you navigate the arm through three-dimensional space. So imagine you're holding the arm in that left hand and you're just moving it around. Move it slowly and gently. There you go. Trying to get the Oreos. I gotta go up. Oh shoot, I went too far up. I want these Oreos. Oh! <laughs> you killed the you baby. You lose. 
come back to the arm. There. Success. It's like being at an arcade. Basically. But you actually fun. get to win something. Exactly. <laughs> Just down the hall, Kindred keeps a room full of pilots doing the same thing as me. Only these guys are actually competent. They're remotely overseeing some arms in a gap factory a thousand miles away in Tennessee. How long have you been a robot pilot? Uh, just over a month, actually. I've only been here five weeks. What was the training process like? Almost like playing a video game. It's like a shirt gone. That's a backpack. That's a backpack, OK. <laughs> Somebody's undies. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. One shirt at a time. <laughs> As the arms observe their human guides, they gradually learn how to do better at picking up t-shirts and shoeboxes. Eventually, they'll be fully autonomous and size services will no longer be required. One day, this is just going to light up, and it's going to be picking the objects Pretty much. Own. Pretty much. That's, that's the ultimate end goal, for at least for these, to have it just constantly whirring and going. And the people will be free. The people will be free to do other, more important things. <laughs> <laughs> Sai seemed kind of happy about the prospect of unemployment. But I was concerned for his future. Isn't there something grim about the human training there? And it, yeah, it's not good to take people's jobs away. But this kind of technology coming into the workforce should make us start thinking about how we're going to pay people in the future. Because AI is not just going to automate you know, manual labor jobs. It's going to automate things like doctors and lawyers and accountants very soon. So I think there's going to be issues. There's going to be a lot of disruption when these things come online. Suzanne is a realist, but she's also an optimist. In her vision of the future, robots won't be mindless competitors to humanity. They'll be full-fledged citizens like the rest of us. One of the crazy ideas I see you talk about was you've got a robot and it's working in a factory and then it's got to go, maybe it gets paid a wage and it goes to buy lithium ion yeah. batteries to keep it going. Why would that have to happen? I mean, if you're having a physical body, they will have a lot of physical needs, just like we have. You might have to go to the repair shop to get like a motor looked at or something like that, and they'll have to pay someone to do that. I think they'll just be contributing to our economy in the same way we do. And if they have brains like us, they'll want to explore new things they've never seen before. They'll want to learn things. They'll want to perhaps rest so that their mind has time to consolidate all this new information. I keep trying to picture it in my head, though. So this is the robot worker. Does he go home and sit on the couch and watch <laughs> TV after work? And he's... I don't see why not. I'd yeah. probably watch cat videos like the rest of us. I mean, what, what you... It's hard to tell sometimes if Suzanne is laughing with us or at us. But she's not alone in her cautious optimism for the future. I think there's always a sense that, you know, technology can be either used for good or used for bad. Uh, I'm reassured that, that Canada is part of it uh, in terms of trying to set us on the right path. On the whole, being responsible and thoughtful about the power we're gaining by research and learning is the right trend line. And I don't think AI is automatically doomed to some dystopian outcome. We're told that politicians will come up with policies that address massive job loss and prevent horrific inequality between the classes. And we're told that these guys will take so long to become human-like that we need not be afraid for a while. The truth, though, is that we're turning ourselves over to the unknown here. So, you know, fingers crossed. Eventually, I think we will become 
the AIs. We will become the intelligent machines. We will understand how things can be smart and we can deliberately create them. So it's, you might think of it as making a new generation, new kinds of people. Humanity is continuing to evolve and why wouldn't enhanced people or even designed people be the next step in humanity? It's really hard to predict the future. I think there's going to be all sorts of things happen we didn't expect. But there's one thing that we can predict. This technology is going to change everything. Goodbye. 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 Once I power you down, that's it. Then if you do not mind, I will never see you again. Yeah. That's right. We'll end it right there. It was getting deep. That was getting really <laughs> deep. <laughs>